Pastor Alex, thank you so much for your welcome. You may be seated. Wow, awesome worship. It is my privilege and honor to be here uh, for the first time at this church to share with you about how my faith in God has really transformed my life. And I don't know who you are and what you go through, maybe uh, from week to week or month to month. Uh, I never compare our suffering. Maybe you have a physical pain. Maybe you have an emotional, mental uh, uh, cycle of just ups and downs. If you see my foot, we all have ups and downs and ups and downs. And many people see that I have no arms and legs and they say, wow, I can't imagine having no limbs. And I tell them really quickly, I believe it's worse being in a broken home than having no arms and legs. And when you look at the existence of understanding how God created us of four elements, we have our soul, our spirit, our mind, and then our body. And there are many times in life where God really doesn't make sense. To me as a child, especially when I heard that God was a loving God, I'm like, I don't understand, then why did he allow this to happen, number one? Number two, why doesn't he change my circumstance? Number three, if I figure out in scriptures that actually pain came from Satan, the serpent in the Garden of Eden, and God knew that all that bad stuff was gonna happen if the serpent was in the Garden of Eden, why did he let him in the first place? And fourthly, how can the people that I love who don't believe in Jesus not go to heaven? And, and there was just these big, big questions that I had, and I didn't know where to begin except from today. When I realized that, yes, I didn't know what I didn't know, but I want to search for the truth if there is a truth, because there had to be something more. It can't just be existing and coexisting and I'm living for today and I'm just going to do my best and that's it and then be remembered to be a good person. You know, there are so many people that have different philosophies of life and what I love about how God made us all is he gave us life, hope, and free choice. And I'll never forget, I've met some amazing people along the way who have different philosophies of life. And I'll never forget when I was 12 years old, this woman saw me for the first time and she said, were you born this way? I said, yes. She said, well, you, do you know why? I said, no. She said, well, I know why. And I'm thinking, really, this stranger, I'm 12 years old. My doctors don't know why I was born this way. My parents don't know why I was born this way. Lady Gaga don't know why I was born this way. <laughs> And she says, have you ever heard of reincarnation? And I said, no. She said, it's simple, you're a perfect example. In your previous life, you were a very, very, very bad boy, and now you're being punished. And I'm thinking like, what do you say to that? And you say, oh, thank you so much. <laughs> She's like, but don't worry, because in your next life, you're gonna come back like a butterfly. And I'm thinking, I'm not gonna tell this woman how many butterflies I've killed in my wheelchair. <laughs> I think that sucks. I don't want to be a butterfly. And my parents always said, don't worry, God's going to plan for you. We love you. God loves you. You're special. And I'm like, I don't want to be special. <laughs> and you know, kids would come up and they would be like, what happened? And I'd tell them, cigarettes. And when you don't know the future, sometimes, listen very carefully, sometimes we start adding limits to what God could actually do. Remember, for what is impossible for man to do, nothing is impossible for God to do, amen? amen. That he can even take my broken pieces and do something beautiful. The first verse, if you want to write verses down, Romans 8, 28, all things come together for the good for those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Jeremiah chapter 29, God has a hope, plan, and a future for me. But where is it? And where is God when he doesn't make sense? You know, when you only see a little bit of the picture or you see something, you don't know for sure if it's real. It's interesting. We've done a couple pranks along the way. So I've been able to go to 70 countries and preach the gospel 3,500 times. And out of eight and a half million people, uh, we've seen 1.1 million decisions for Jesus Christ face to face. And um, it's been really, really incredible. And sometimes we pull pranks off. Like um, <laughs> it was about five years ago. I don't know if you've seen me on YouTube. Anyone see me on YouTube? Yeah. 
Put your hand up if you've never heard me speak face to face. You've never heard me speak face to face? Awesome. So on YouTube, there's one of these videos that we actually, my friend is the commercial airline pilot, and I actually borrowed his uniform <laughs> and jumped on his plane, and I actually greeted the passengers as they came on the plane. <laughs> I told him that we had some new technology, and I was so excited that we're with us. So, I had, like, I was fully dressed up like a pilot, and I'll tell you, man, some people gave their life to Jesus Christ right there. <laughs> it was awesome. And talk about not seeing the full picture. One day, I'm in the front seat of the car, and we're at the traffic lights, and this car comes up next to us, and this girl's looking at me, so I'm looking at her, and all she sees is my head from the side. So just imagine all you see is my head from the side. I'm, I'm going to freak you out. So I just did this. Change the camera, wrong view, just straight on to the, the other one that you had. Good, stick there, here we go. All she sees is my head, I just did this. <laughs> and she thought my head did a 360 degree spin and her face was like, was so good. You know, when I was a child, I would get bullied at school and I, and I started putting limits on myself. I started uh, coming up with, listen to this, fearful conclusions based on three factors. What I felt, what I knew, what I saw. What I felt, what I knew, what I saw. Based on what you feel, based on what you know, and based on what you see, which is actually not by faith. Faith is not believing by sight or living in sight, but by faith, not by sight. And when you look at our disabilities of our heart and disabilities of our lives, when you look at the word disabled, D-I-S-A-B-L-E-D, -E and you hear the voice of God and you are obedient and you answer the call and say, go and sin no more. Go, I will be with you, says God. Don't worry, I'll carry you when you cannot walk. Nothing will ever change my love for you. I will even, and I can even make you and cause you to be a miracle for someone else even before I give you your miracle. That is the God where you put a G-O in front of the word disabled and it spells God is abled. To do what? <laughs> to do exceedingly abundantly more than you can ever ask, imagine, or attain. And never in my wildest dreams, nor in my parents' dreams, did they ever think that their limbless child would go around the world. Never in my mind when I was at school did I ever think I'd get married. Do you see this timeline here? If I was eight years old looking at, looking at my future, I had no idea that God's going to do so many things. I actually was listening to the lies. Based on what you see, what you feel, what you know when you ask God, and based on your expectations in the framework of your environment, how you feel, and what you think about Him, doesn't change who He is. And so when I was actually looking for truth, before I found the truth, I was chained with lies. You're ugly. Just give up. You're the only one with no arms and no legs in the world. There is no hope for you. There is no plan. There is no purpose. There is no God. You ask for arms and legs. Where is he? You're not going to get a job. You're not going to get married. Even if you got married, you can't even hold your wife's hand. Even if you had kids, you can't even hold your children when they're crying. I want to show you a family photo. This is my family. My wife, Kane, she's half Japanese, half Mexican. We call that Japsican. <laughs> it was love at first sight. I looked at her. She looked at me. I couldn't feel my legs. <laughs> We've been married now for seven years. We have four children. Kiyoshi, he's six and a half. Dayan, he's four. And these twin identical girls, Olivia and Ali, who are 20 months old. exceedingly abundantly more than you can ever ask, imagine, or even handle. I want you to see this photo. This is a crowd shot now. This is the 17th of September 2017 in Kiev, Ukraine. 800,000 people were there, 400,000 gave their life to Jesus, and 53 million people heard the gospel of Jesus on television to 53 million people.
And this next photo, I was able to talk to the Ukrainian government about the honoring of God as a nation in your law, men and women of integrity. If you notice and look closely, they're not sitting in their seats, they're on their knees. And during national television, 20 million Ukrainians were watching a limbless man evangelize to them and talk to them about God and the Bible and honoring the Lord. And then after an hour and a half of everyone discussing after my 20 minute presentation, I said, would you please get on your knees and let's ask God to bless Ukraine. So we prayed in the name of Jesus that God would forgive the sins of Ukraine and to heal their land. And that's the 10th government we've been able to get into by the grace of God. And we are indeed praying for America. It's unbelievable. It's miraculous. When I was begging for God to give me arms and legs, little did I know that at 24 years old, I would be speaking in front of a Californian church and seeing a little boy with no arms and no legs being held up by the crowd. No arms, no legs, little 19-month-old Daniel Martinez with a little foot like me, and I'm like, wow. I wanna wrestle him later on. <laughs> and I brought him up on stage, and he's looking up at me, and I'm looking down at him, and I can't give him a high five, so I put my little foot in his foot, and he smiled, and then everyone cried. His mom came up, she cried, and she said, thank you for being our miracle. I'm like, dude, I can't take any credit. Why? I ain't the author of my faith. I don't hold the pen. I say, thank you, God, that you even said no when I asked for arms and legs. There will be many people to say that as long as you have faith and as long as you stand righteous with God and as long as you're obedient, as long as you have faith, as long as you go to church, as long as you ba 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 ba, then God will give you everything you need. I actually see many other scriptures on the contrary. And I want you to understand this one beautiful thing about our relationship with Jesus Christ here on earth. It's the relationship of us as children with our Heavenly Father. And the pinnacle of our relationship is not when he blesses you with everything you want. He delights in giving us good gifts, correct? Yes. But how beautiful it is to understand that if I have cancer, do you understand this? If I have cancer and God heals me of cancer, one day I'll be in a car accident, one day I'm going to take my last breath, one day something's going to happen and eventually, guess what guys, Nick's going to die. And if God always answers my prayer, then his divine purpose of me being a citizen of heaven, passing through and going home, will not be satisfied. I can pray for arms and legs, and in fact, ladies and gentlemen, I have a pair of shoes in my closet just in case he gives me arms and legs. And I have seen 13 miracles, blind people seeing, deaf people hearing, lame people walking crooked, backs come straight. I am not an atheist because I've seen angels. I'm not an atheist because I've seen demons, and not just in Africa, but in California. And when you see demons, you ain't atheist after that, baby. <laughs> what I'm trying to say is Philippians 4, verse 6 and 7 says, present your requests to God and let the peace of God that surpasses all understanding Guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. It's the pinnacle of God's joy when his child says, Daddy, can I please have this? And he says, no. Okay, I trust you. Proverbs 3, verse 5 and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart, lean not upon your own understanding, acknowledge Him in all your ways and He will direct your paths. What is better than for God to give a limbless man limbs? It is that little boy, little Daniel, no arms and no legs, and that if he sees another limbless man where God had a plan, and his parents saw my parents to see that God had a plan. And when we go to heaven, I hear my name. Hey, Nick! And I'm gonna look. It'll be Daniel Martinez running to me with his new legs, hugging me with his new arms and saying, thank you, brother, for helping me believe that this place called heaven was real. You see, your history is his story. I don't know how it is to be sexually abused. Maybe you do. Maybe you had an alcoholic father. Maybe you've never had a father. I had a good home, but I had no arms and legs. God can use me to help other limbless people, but God can use you 
just as powerful because your history is his story. You know how it feels to be in your shoes and then God will not waste your pain. It's not in vain that he can even cause the worst parts of your life to become part of his plan and purpose. But you gotta know the truth. Don't die with the lie, be free from the truth. I was listening to those lies that took me closer and closer and closer. And at age 10, I actually attempted suicide. I tried to drown myself in my bathtub and I had a quick vision in my mind of seeing my mom and my dad crying at my grave and I didn't want them to have that pain. So by the grace of God, everyone say by the grace of God. <laughs> by the grace of God, I stayed and, and, and I was able to realize at age 15 the difference between truth and lies. And it came from the one yearning that I had. God, give me a plan. Have you ever asked God for a plan? and then he doesn't answer you, so you suggest a plan B, and a couple other options and variations, and he still doesn't come back to you. I want you to know that if he gave me the plan, then why would I need to trust him? The pinnacle of your relationship with God is when he doesn't give you the plan and you say, but I trust you. That is it. Thank God that he doesn't always give me what I want, when I want, how I want it. Because I would get so comfortable. How less do you pray? How much less do you pray when everything's going good? And how much more do you pray when things are going bad? Oh God, teach me more patience. Then get ready to be put in a place to wait. It's not an injection. Are you with me? You gotta know the truth of three things, the truth of your value, the truth of your purpose, and the truth of the full potential plan that God has for you. Some of you teenagers, you're all trapped in, you know, I gotta look tough and I gotta be cool and say the F word to be cool at school. I don't say the F word, am I still cool? Yeah, I've never done drugs, never will do drugs, I don't get drunk, never needed to get drunk, didn't go partying with my friends, I did not give my virginity until I met the mother of my children. Why? Because I knew that sex ain't love. You can sleep with anyone you want as many times you want, still wonder do they love me. Sex is for marriage, sex out of marriage is a counterfeit for how God designed marriage. Are you with me? Woman of God, if you want to marry a man of God, you better be ready to be the woman of God. You don't need a boyfriend to feel loved. You need to know your identity is knowing that you're a daughter of the King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Your royalty angels are with you. You shouldn't be looking for a boyfriend, you should be looking for a husband. And if your husband can't honor God and keep his hands off of you before you get married, how do you expect him to actually honor God after you get married? Some of you teenagers think it's cool to actually go to church on Friday, think that you're actually saved, and then you tease and gossip people at school on Monday. You don't know the love of God. It's okay to say the F word. Actually, if you read and study the word of God, First of all, if you look at Peter, as one example, he denied Jesus three times, and on the third time to convince everyone that he was absolutely not a follower of Jesus, he used the F word. Read it. <laughs> you don't need big biceps. My biceps are so big they fell off, you understand me? You don't need to have the best job or a job to find your place in the kingdom. Do you know who God used to actually inspire me for the first time to be a speaker? He looked at me and said, you're gonna be a speaker. The janitor at my high school, 61 year old Indian man, Arnold, he said, you're gonna be a speaker. I said, you're a crazy old man. If God can use a man without arms and legs to be his hands and feet, then God can use any willing heart. Amen? Amen. I wanted arms and legs, though. I wanted arms and legs. Today, I can tell you, I don't need hands to hold my wife's hand. I don't care about holding her hand. I need to hold her heart. My kids, when they cry, I can't put my arms around them, but they put their arms around me when they cry. I wanted arms and legs. What do you, what do you want? What do you want? 
You talk to eight, nine, ten-year-olds, and you say, hey, guys, can I ask you a question? And they're like, uh-huh. I said, have you guys ever, ever, ever in your life been stressed? And they're like, uh-huh. I said, what's stressing you out? Oh, homework is so hard. And my parents, they didn't give me everything I want. And my siblings, they annoy me every single day. I'm so stressed. I want to be 13. <laughs> you talk to 13-year-olds. Any 13-year-olds in the house, give me a whoop. Now you know what stress is. <laughs> oh, everything around me is changing. I thought I could trust my friends, and then they backstab me. They invite me to the party, then they uninvite me to the party. I put a do not disturb sign on my door. I need my privacy. I am so stressed out right now. I need a boyfriend. I want to be 17. If I get 17, you get 17. Now you're going to be so stressed out because you're going to get to college. If I can just get into college, then everything's going to be okay. You get to college and is everything okay? No. What do you now need? Money. Oh, Lord Jesus Christ of Nazareth, may I please, please have a job. Because if I have a job, then everything's going to be okay. You finally get your job. And after two days, <laughs> you look at your boss in the face and you look at God and you say, really? You give me him? I hate him. He stresses me. Ah! And then all the single people. Oh, oh. <laughs> oh, when I finally find the one, don't stop me, Romeo. <laughs> if I can just find the one, then everything's gonna be okay. No, go talk to the married people. <laughs> I'll tell you, honey, if you ain't happy single, you ain't gonna be happy married. Can you hear an amen? Yeah. There's the married people saying amen. Well, Nick, you know, I just want to pay off my debts and, you know, pay off our cars and get a house that's paid off and maybe get a couple rental properties one day. And then what? Well, I just want to be good and then... No, look, listen very carefully. Money, drugs, sex, alcohol, pornography, fame, and fortune. If you put your happiness in temporary things, your happiness will be temporary. It's not that difficult. I get a little money, I want some more. I want this and I want some more. You start with this drug and you want some more. You do this, you do that, and you want some more. It's just there's this never-ending hunger because there is a God-shaped hole in our soul. And we continue to look on the outside when we actually forget to look first at our soul. And at age 15 is when I gave my life to Jesus Christ. I read John chapter 9, changed my whole life. Because here I am waiting for a plan, waiting for a plan. Give me a plan, give me a plan. I hated God for eight years. And then at age 15, John chapter 9 says that Jesus comes across a man who was born blind. And they asked him, why was he born that way? Was it because his parents sinned as a punishment? Was it because he sinned? Doesn't that sound like reincarnation to you? Yeah. It's not, a, it's not a new thing. Okay? Just understand that. Jesus said, no, it was done so that the works of God would be revealed through him or displayed through him. Jesus spits in the dirt, gets mud or clay, puts it on that man's face. After they wash it off his face, guess what? He sees. What's interesting to me is not that another miracle happened. What's awesome that changed my life is that was if I was blind and I'm hearing this conversation and then all of a sudden it goes silent and I hear a boom. <laughs> and someone's approaching me and they start putting mud on my face. I'd be like, hey, whoa, 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 time out. Who are you? What do you want? I didn't want a facial. <laughs> JC, Jesus Christ, he didn't sit down and say, hey, my name's JC, I'm the healer, and I'm going to blah, 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 and then you're going to see, okay? He didn't run it by him. He didn't ask for his permission. 
The blind man could have stepped back. The blind man could have walked away. The blind man could have stopped him. But he was still, and he allowed God to do his, his miracle. I want you to know that I am so thankful that I realized that he doesn't need to give me the plan. I just need to believe that he has one. And if I can be understanding, it's not just the faith for miracles, it's the faith that's the awareness. It's connected to the awareness of the authority of God. Newsflash, God may have a better plan. My dad died of cancer, guess why? Because he's not in a place of pain, suffering, he's gone home, I'm going home. Home, my treasures aren't here. I aren't asking God for millions of dollars. I know that he will always give me what I need. And I can ask him for what I want and regardless, I will worship him because what else can God have given me than his only begotten son who died for me? who rose again. And when you believe in Jesus, then you know who you are, not not because of who you are. Who are we? I I actually don't love all the songs that are being written these days. Who are we to think that we can crown God? He is crowned. We are small. Yes, we crown him and exalt him as king of kings, as his children, yes. But God is so far above us. He doesn't owe me a thing. And he's given me everything I need. Do I look disabled to you? No. Hallelujah. You have cancer? We will pray for that cancer to be gone in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. But do you know when the devil wins is when he's taken away your joy. And God sent you today, a man without arms and legs, to let you know you can still have joy even when your circumstance don't change. Can I have someone play some keys up here? That would be awesome. Austin, if you can come play keys. I'll be, I play keys, but I'm not warmed up yet. <laughs> Let me tell you a couple stories, if I may. So 15, I gave my life to Jesus Christ. The janitor started my first speaking engagement. He arranged it in front of six people. My palms were sweating. My knees were shaking. I had no idea what I was going to say. <laughs> Did you get that one? And then at age 19, 2002 was the year that I started ministry for real. And I went to the doctor because I had like this pinching nerve. I couldn't feel my left arm, so I went to the MRI, got an MRI, and the orthopedic surgeon came out with the results. And he said, we have some terrible news. I said, what's that? He said, you were born with a very rare disease. And I said, yeah, I know. He said, no, in your spine, there's a disease called a syrinx. You only get this disease if you were born with it. You were born with it. You can't reverse it, can't cure it, can't slow it down. I'm sorry to tell you that by age 35 to 45, you will have no spinal cord. It's turning into nothing, turning into fluid. Here are the three holes, here and here and here. Ten years later, I got another MRI compared 02 to 2012. 02, three holes, 2012, two holes. And the doctor said, I do concur with the Australian doctor, this is California, that you do have a syrinx, and this is absolutely impossible that it's reversed. And I'm thinking, not with God. (laughs) Fast forward to November 2014, my third MRI, fourth MRI scan. I have no holes in my spine. Here's a fact, ready? Whether you like it or not, you're not gonna wake up tomorrow and say, wow, I can't believe God healed Nick's back.
but tomorrow morning you're gonna wake up and say, God, I want what he has. I want that joy, I want that peace, I want that purpose. You know, don't become a Christian just because of Christians because you won't be a Christian for a long time. You know that bumper sticker? Dear Jesus, save me from thy followers. <laughs> I've seen that one. People may fail you, churches may fail you, but Jesus will never fail you. <laughs> Follow Jesus. Do your research. Why can good people not go to heaven? Very simple. Let's start off with the serpent of Garden of Eden. If God didn't allow the serpent in the Garden of Eden, then I could intellectually win the argument that God never gave Adam and Eve choice. Do you understand? If all they heard was God's voice, then they had no choice, no free choice. So God gave them life, hope, and free choice. Are you with me? So I have a choice to believe in the power of this table if I want, but I don't think this table's gonna do much for me when I'm dead, are you with me? When you're dead, there's only one power that can raise you from the grave, it's called resurrection. There was only one resurrection, there was only one person who said that I am gonna resurrect as the Son of God, I'm gonna die for the sins of the world, who is holy, I am God, and whoever believes in me shall not perish but have everlasting life. No one will go to the Father but through me, Jesus. Do you want to know why Jesus is the only one for me? Because I've done my research and I want you to just understand, here are the quick, quick religions in the world. First of all, you have people who say, well, all you need is positivity. It's not enough, right? Positivity should not be your coping mechanism. Coping, your coping mechanism should be actually finding hope. Find hope. Find hope and you got hope if it's real. And when you find hope, if it's real, you're then positive, are you with me? When you look at the major religions out there, there's one religion where you have to actually keep about 616 commandments. I'm struggling with 10. Are, are you with me? There is another religion where there are 330 million gods that you need to please. And then if you're born into a poor family, or you're born as a slave, or you're born as disabled, there is no hope for you. There's another religion where there's many, many, many commandments and rules that if you do it, and you do it really, really, really well, and you're 100%, there's still not 100% guarantee that you're gonna go to heaven. There's only one way in that religion that you can be 100% guarantee that you're going to heaven. You wanna know how? Killing another person of a certain religion. Do your research. Why do I say this? Because one day I was found on a stage talking to 650 sex slaves, 17 years old, sold into slavery at age 10. Some of them sold by their own mother. What do you tell them? Reincarnation, better luck next time, be good, do good, good's gonna happen. None of that, do 616 commandments, better luck next time, no. I told them, Jesus loves you and God has heaven for you and no matter what shame or guilt or pain or addiction or affliction or oppression or depression you have, there is not one chain that Jesus cannot break. Come to him, all who are weary and heavy laden and he will give you Rest. Not only will he give you rest, but he can even use the worst part of your life for the good according to his purposes. That's pretty bold to tell somebody. But when you found something to die for, you found something to live for. And you know it's true, not just in your life and other testimonies. And I want you to know that these girls, many of them came to Jesus. Many of them went through a rehab process. They found Jesus. They then found a job. They saved up money, not for a car, not for a house. They went back to the brothels where they were once a slave in. They, came, they took a bucket of water with a white towel. They knocked on the door of the house that they were once a slave in. The pimp and madame opens the door and says, who are you? I used to be your slave. What do you want? I've come here today to tell you about Jesus. 
He forgave me and there is no condemnation now for me. I am free. And you have power and you have money, but your soul is dark. You do not have rest. He forgave me of everything that I've ever done wrong and I didn't deserve that. And you don't deserve my forgiveness, but he forgave me, so who am I not to forgive you? And I've come here to wash your feet. And they're weeping and they're weeping and they're weeping and they say, here's money, give me a slave, I'm taking her. And they buy out another slave and they say, hey honey, I'm now your older sister and that's never gonna happen to you again. Jesus loves you and they bring another slave to Jesus. They get rehab, and then they go back and rescue another one. If that's not redemption, I don't know what is, church. Amen? So what do you think I want? Arms and legs for 90 years It's gonna give me arthritis later on anyway? Or that one moment in heaven that lasts forever? Are you coming? I don't know about you. I'm not waiting for my bank to be bigger. I'm not waiting for this or that. I'm not waiting for relationship seasons to change before I'm happy. I'm not waiting for, I'm free. Are you free? Some of you 48 year old women are still disabled by the things that your father told you when you were nine years old. Some things You can pray away some things you cannot, some things you need counseling for. And I want you to know though that there's no greater counsel than the Holy Spirit as you read and reflect and hold onto the promises of God. When the enemy says, you can't do this. No, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. You're a nobody. No, I'm a forgiven, redeemed child of God, of the King of kings and Lord of lords, and I'm a general in his army standing in front of the gates of hell redirecting traffic. So daily, when you turn away from these lies, saying these lies are you ugly and all that, you just tell those lies. <laughs> Stop talking to me. You talk to the foot because the ears ain't listening, and you turn around. Say, God, teach me. Show me how to live. Show me how to pray. I know I'm never going to be perfect, but Father, I, I believe that Jesus is your son. He died for me. You know, when you go to a grocery store and you pick up an item and you go to the cashier and beep, five bucks. You give him five bucks, you get the product, and you're out. Yes? How weird would it be if, beep, five bucks, I give him five bucks, and I say, I hope that's enough. Would that be weird? If it costs five bucks, you pay five bucks, it's done. What would be interesting is, beep, five bucks, here's three bucks, is that enough? What's she going to say? No. Why? Well, that's just the way it is. Adam and Eve didn't have to die until they had sin. Death is the penalty for sin. The price paid for eternal life is death. Forgive me of my doctrine, but illustratively speaking, you pick up the product of eternal life. Beep! Death. Jesus comes and says, I did that for you. Come with me. And if you believe that he did that for you, and you believe that he rose again, that's when you become unstoppable. That's when circumstances don't dictate anything. That's when people's opinions don't affect your future. Because it's God. Help me, God. Help me, God. Help me, God. Oh, Nick, no, I can't give my life to Jesus Christ yet. Why not? Let me tell you one last story. There was a woman who was on the floor in a a house half the size of this stage, sitting on the floor, hunched over like this after we spoke to 650 slaves, and she's hunched over like, if you told me she was 140 years old, I'd believe you. And I started to talk to her about Jesus. She says, nothing, she's listening. Her sister though comes in, really angry. She comes in, crosses her arms like this. She says, who are you? And I said, I'm here to talk about Jesus. I'm sick of you people coming in here from the West telling me about your Jesus and you can't even show me his power. She said, get out of my house or make her walk now. I said, excuse me? She said, if your Jesus is real, make her walk now. 
She hasn't walked for four and a half years. Look at her, skin and bone, she's dying. We have to carry her to the restroom. She's done. So I said to God quickly in my heart, I said, God, um, just in case you're not aware of what's going on, I'm about to pray for a woman who hasn't walked for four and a half years. Do you mind please showing up? I knew I had to pray, and we prayed. At that time, I've already seen 12 miracles, blind people seeing, deaf people hearing, lame people walking, crooked backs come straight. I've seen 12 miracles at that time. I had that faith, and I said, God, she's putting you on the spot. You're not putting me on the spot. You know my faith. We pray once, she can't walk. We pray t twice, and she goes from this, and she said it was as if an electricity jolt went through her. Her back went immediately straight. Her eyes opened up. She took a like this, and she said, electricity, electricity, electricity. Her back was straight, the tremor's gone. She got up, and you know it's real when that person who just got a miracle cries for joy, for, for shouting and punching in the air and jumping up and down on the floor, weeping for 20 minutes, that's when you know it's real. The reason why I tell you about this miracle is because the person who took me there said, I can't believe what happened. I said, what do you mean? He said, that woman that God just healed. I said, yeah, that was awesome. He said, that's probably the most evil woman you'll ever meet in your life. I said, what did she do? He said, Nick, that red light district where you have 250 houses trafficking children, six in each, plus an underground cage level. She started human trafficking in Mumbai in 1960s. That piece of land I showed you was nothing but land, and she put her flag there and said, this is my land, and we're going to make a lot of money trafficking humans. 40 thousand slaves later without her saying sorry without her praying without her nothing God healed her my human mind says how unfair is that at times we think well how can God heal someone like that and he doesn't heal my cousin God is God God is God. I can't tell you what happens to the people who never hear about Jesus Christ who die without hearing about Jesus. God is a judge. I don't know that. I can't explicitly explain that in the scriptures, but I can tell you this, that when you hear the voice of God, do not harden your heart. Let him in. And there is one day when the devil will be no more, and that is when all of 8 billion people have heard that Jesus is real, and they have a choice, and they make a choice, and that's when we go home. And I don't know about you, but I want to go home. And it's fa fascinating and just phenomenal, that verse where it says, no sin can separate you from the love of God. If my son walks and falls, am I going to beat him up? No, I'll pick him up. If my son curses at me, spits in my face, I'm still going to love him because he is my son. He is mine. You are his. There is nothing, nothing that can separate you from the love of God. Well, I need to stop having a pornographic addiction. Yeah, you do, but let's see it from this point of view. Ready? If your house is broken and there's a carpenter willing to help you fix what you can't fix, how do you expect him to fix your broken home until you let him in? Don't let Jesus Christ into your life as a guest in your house. Because when the devil comes knocking, the guest never opens the door. The owner does. The Bible says this very clearly. Ready? This is it. Last thing. Ready? If you hold on to your life, you will lose your life. If you give up your life, you will have your life saved. Jesus, here's the key. This is much bigger than me. Come into my life. I want your plan, not my plan. I want your strength, not my strength. It's time. And in a moment, I want to give an opportunity to respond and come forward. To do what? To say a prayer, to say, God, forgive me of my sins. Come into my life. Heal me. I want you. I want to live for you. Well, why can't I do it from my seat? Sure, you can pray from your seat, but let me just say this. If you can't stand up for a faith decision in a church building here, how do you expect to stand up for a faith decision out there? Well, I wanna, 
I, I want to hold on to that decision. Well, let, let, let's say this. Indecision is your decision. And indecision means a no now. And now is now. Ready? Now is now. And now is now. And now is now. And tomorrow is tomorrow is tomorrow is tomorrow is tomorrow. And yesterday you can't get back. That's why it's now. Now make your choice. You don't have to be worried. I'm not going to lay hands on you or anything. <laughs> but we've seen 1.1 million people give their life to Jesus Christ. And Christians, this is not the time to kind of shift and grab your things and think about leaving anytime soon just because this preacher preached a little longer than normal maybe. This is when you're silently praying for the people in front of you, behind you, and beside you. Silently. If you know who Jesus is, awesome. If you don't know who Jesus is, ready? You go to sleep, you don't wake up, where are you going to be? I know where I'm going to be. I'm going home. I'm going to see my dad. I'm going to see my first created dad. Yeah? Are you going to be there? And so right now from the front to the back and even on the balcony, I preached three times this morning to a total of 800 people. About 81 people gave their life to Jesus. So this, this evening, this evening, I'm, I'm really... I'm actually really expecting at least 100 right here, right now to say, you know what? Enough's enough. I want to give my life to Jesus. And we don't need any volunteers or any other ushers coming forward or anything like that right now. But right now, if you're, if you're looking at me and you know your heart's beating and your feet are heavy, God's knocking on that door. Let him in. Don't try to fix yourself up before you you become more presentable. No. When you look from the plane, all buildings look flat. Imagine from God's point of view. No matter how tall that building is, your righteousness is nothing compared to His holiness. It's a surrender to say, God, please, here's the driver's seat. Take over. Here's the key. It's your house, not mine. Amen? So right now, from the front to the back. Do not come up here for a rededication. Do not come up here for a recommitment. This is you don't know if you're saved. And if you don't know that you're saved and you want to know that you know that you know that when you put your head on that pillow tonight, you have rest in your soul. It starts with a prayer that I want to lead you in. Here at the front. And when you come up the front, listen to me. Bring your belongings so you're not worried about your belongings. And when you come up to the floor, do not come up on the stage, but stay on the floor, but face me so your back's to the crowd. Now, with no further ado, from the youngest to the oldest, if you know that you need to give your life to the Lord Jesus Christ, do not wait for the first person. Be the first person. If that's you right now, stand and come on down. If you see someone coming on down, then clap them on down. Right there is good. There's one. Come on, church. You know that you need to give your life to Jesus. You can remain standing. Don't worry. My knees hurt after a while. It's going to be a while. Church, I want you to get a little bit excited. We got one, two, three, four, five. Just remain standing. You don't need to kneel if you don't want to. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Guys, heaven is rejoicing while people are coming. So why don't you join heaven just for a little bit? Teenagers, there is no fence. Either you're living for God, God's way, or you're living for you, your way. Young couples, older couples, grab each other's hands and say, I need to go up there. I need to make my life right with Jesus. Single mothers, single fathers, foster kids, adopted children, whoever you are, come on forward. I'm waiting for 100 people tonight and I will count them. That's 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22. Every single soul counts. Hallelujah. 23. From the balcony, move. Come on down. He will take away your depression. He will take away your chains. He will set you free. He will give you the truth that you're looking for. 
23, 24, 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36. Keep on coming. They're coming down, 37, 38, 39, 40, 41, 42, 43, 44, 45, 46, 47, 48. 49, in the name of Jesus. Church, let's stop for a second. Let's hold the applause for a second. Keep coming, keep coming. Listen, this is the last and final call. This is how we're gonna do it, ready? There are so many more teenagers you need to make your life right with God. There are children, eight, nine, 10 years old, you need to make your life right with Jesus. This is the night, don't delay. Tomorrow's not promised. But this is the way we're gonna do a last and final call, ready? You're thinking of thinking of come and stop thinking about it. And you're thinking, but I wanna go up there, but I don't, I don't wanna go alone. Okay, fair enough, fair enough, okay? This is the trick, ready? In fact, do me a favor, you have theater seats. Everyone stand to your feet. We're gonna make all excuses disappear. Shuffle up against that seat. So then people can just walk by you. We've made it as simple as possible. Now listen to me very carefully, you ready? Keep the house lights on, please do not change the lights. Listen to me very carefully. This is the last and final call. If you know that you know you need to make your life right with Jesus and you don't even wanna come alone, simply turn to the person next to you and say, hey, I really wanna go up there. I just don't wanna go alone. Will you please come with me? And guess what they're gonna say? Yes. With friends, I'm waiting for another 70 people. With friends, from now. Go, last time, now. Five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10. Move from the top. Eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 27, 28. Come on, church, move, 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 move. Come on, church is not done, move. Come on down, come on down, come on down. 31. 32, 33, 34. It's 34, 35, 36, 37, 38 more. 39, 40, 41, 42 more. I'm waiting, I'm waiting for 28 more people before we finish. Do you understand? It's a good guess. We're gonna wait from the last call from the top. 28, come on down, last call, final call. Can't be here all night. Here we go, gonna count down 28. 28, 27, 26, 25. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. 24, 23. Come on down. Thank you, Jesus. We're at 97, at least, people up the front. Hallelujah. No more, are we said, are we done? Good. Let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear God, we come before you today and we thank you so much for your love. We give you all the praise and all the glory. We acknowledge you as the King of kings and Lord of lords. Who are we that you'd be mindful of us? Lord Jesus, we thank you that we are nothing, yet we are everything to you. So much so that you would die for us. Thank you, Lord, that you have a plan for everyone. Lord, we pray for depression to go. We pray for sickness to go. We pray for principalities and powers of darkness to be gone in the name of Jesus. We thank you for physical miracles. And Lord, we thank you that above everything, the greatest miracle of all is knowing you. To restore our soul, to fill us with your Holy Spirit, and to renew our mind. That we become a new creation. Thank you, Lord. 
Thank you for these people up the front. Bless them in the name of Jesus. If you're up the front, please repeat after me. Say, Dear God, I come to you today and I thank you for loving me. Thank you, Jesus, for dying on the cross for all of my sins. I believe you are the Son of God. You died for me. You rose again. And today, I make a conscious decision to ask you into my life as my Savior, as my King, and as my friend. Thank you, God, that you love me and always will. Change my heart. Forgive me. Change my mind. I give you my pain, my depression, my anxiety, my worries. Help me, Lord, to know that you're with me and you'll never leave me. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Teach me to live, how to pray, how to read my Bible, to know you more each and every day. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Hallelujah. If you're at your seats, have a sit so you can see how many. If you're at a chair, sit down. Everyone at, look at the front, look at me. When we become adopted children of God, we become brothers and sisters. Do you look at my body right now? Look at my body. I am your half brother. Do you understand me? And there's about 110 of you up here, and I want to tell you that we love you. This church loves you. If you do not have a home church, Welcome home. Welcome to your family. We want to come alongside you. We want to pray with you. We will always love you. There is nothing that you will ever tell us about you and what you think that's going to change our love for you. This is Pastor Alex, and we want you to know at this church that everyone is welcome, that there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. There is no shame, there is no guilt, and your past is left behind. Not only does God forgive you of all of your sins, but He says in the Word, He has forgotten them. So from this day on, when you hear, hey, do you remember blah, blah, blah? That's the freaking devil. And you say, get behind me. I am not forsaken. I am a new creation. What's past is past. And what God helps me to move forward. Sorry, I said freaking. You move forward into all that God has for you. Amen. Amen. God has come to give you new life and new life more abundant. We want you to know that we love you. And I want a couple sentences from Pastor Tim to echo Pastor Alex, how much he loves you. I, uh, I'm in awe of what God has done uh, in your life. To think in one moment a miracle has taken place and your destiny is beyond limits. And we are a family, we're not an institution. And this is a place where we love every person to become all that God has called them to be. So we support you, love you, and applaud you for your commitment tonight to follow Jesus. Amen. 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 Tomorrow morning, you're going to wake up and say, okay, what do I do now? We don't want to give you a Bible and say, here's the Bible, good luck. Okay, here's the secret with the Bible. Skip three quarters of it, go straight to John. If you don't have a Bible, each and every one of you are going to be given a Bible tonight. Each and every one of you are also going to be given uh, a congratulatory letter from me. Someone wants to call you and say, hey, how can we pray for you? How can we pray for your family? Let's have our faith join with your faith for whatever addiction, whatever affliction. Maybe you're like, man, you have no idea. Some of my friends are really poisonous around me. I don't even know what to do. We want you to know. Now, we don't want you to pick up a Bible and smash people over the head with it either. 
Everyone experiences their first days with Jesus differently, amen? But what you've done today is this. You've turned around and you're on that path. We want to come around you, pray for you, help you as a newborn baby. Babies don't eat steak filet mignons. They start with breast milk, formula, then mushy food, then chicken, then blah, blah, blah. We want to help you in the spirit to start now learning, okay, what is this? new life in Jesus mean. And to do that, we're going to take three more minutes of your time. Everyone say three minutes. In military style, I ask you to bring your belongings up here. Did you do that? Yes. <coughs> Good. Because if I see you go back to your seats, I will drag you back up. Do you understand me? <laughs> this is a thing. Everyone that gets something is actually going to be given to, it's going to be given to you through those doors over there. Someone's waving over there. Can you wave a little bit bigger like you just don't care with two hands since God gave you two hands as well? And then do you see those people over there? They're going to take you through those doors for three minutes. Everyone say three minutes. Three minutes. It's just as important as you come up here that you go over there. If you need to grab your belongings, but I see you go back to your seats and you sit down, I will drag you back up. Lastly, if you're sitting on your seats, but you didn't come up here and you said that prayer just like these people did, you need exactly what these people are getting tonight. Do you understand? It's not too late to join them. If your child is less than 12 years old and you'd like to accompany them, please feel free to do that. Everyone up the front, look at me, military style. Face this way and move. Let's give God glory.